From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. The House passes legislation that could lead to a ban of TikTok, with China calling it bullying behavior. But the proposal faces a less certain future in the Senate, with questions from conservatives and progressives. We'll talk with Mary Lovely of the Peterson Institute. The rematch is officially set as Joe Biden and Donald Trump clinch the number of delegates they need, each need for their nomination, beginning the longest general election contest in recent history. Six charges are tossed in the Georgia case against Donald Trump as President Biden nears a record low approval rating even after his State of the Union address. We'll talk about it with Alan Abramowitz of Emory University on this day, Kaylee, that the rematch is officially set here we have two presumptive nominees, and in the case of Donald Trump, earlier than expected. Yep, he was able to get that magic 1,215 delegates needed to actually secure the Republican nomination in yesterday's primaries. And now the active general election campaigning has begun. Yeah. Of course, part of Biden's campaign in particular is trying to reach young voters on TikTok. That's one of the things he has underway. And yet that very platform potentially could be banned in the U.S. now that the House has passed legislation. It's now up to the Senate Although, according to House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries, who spoke with reporters after this past earlier today, we shouldn't really be calling it a ban. Take a listen. I don't support a ban on TikTok. The legislation did not ban TikTok. It's simply a divestiture of TikTok so that this social media platform can be owned by an American company that would protect the data and the privacy of the American consumer from malignant foreign interests like the Chinese Communist Party. So joining us now with more on this story and our other top stories today, Bloomberg government's Kate Ackley and Bloomberg's Mario Parker. But Kate, as you cover Congress and have been closely watching the TikTok legislative saga, we'll begin with you. The House passed this with a massive bipartisan margin, only 65 votes against this bill. That isn't necessarily, though, a signal that the Senate is going to take that as a mandate. Chuck Schumer doesn't seem thrilled about this legislation. His statement basically just said they'll, they'll look at it. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot of momentum from that House vote, and it had a lot of momentum coming out of the 50 to nothing committee vote last, you know, last week, where this really came on the scene. And it sort of caught some of the the people on TikTok a little bit by surprise. But we've heard a lot of sort of cooling off statements from people in the Senate, like you're saying, um, Senate Majority Leader Schumer and others. I think, you know, they're looking at, are there going to be changes? There are competing bills. There are, you know, all these people are subject to lobbying influences mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, frankly, both sides. I was, uh, uh, you know, on Capitol Hill yesterday and today, and there are people who, you know, say their business depends on TikTok and they've sort of come. People said they, you know, paid their own way to get here so that they could tell lawmakers, you know, don't don't pass this bill. Of course, it didn't work in the House, but we'll see what happens over in the Senate. Well, when you consider pushback from not only conservatives, but also progressives, it's interesting, especially on First Amendment grounds. We heard from mm -hmm. Maxwell Frost, who's kind of been the face of this argument. He issued a statement saying the legislation is an infringement on our constitutional right to freedom of speech that also places, this is the other part of it, what he calls a near impossible condition for the app to be sold within six months or less. Is he wrong? Right. It, well, I mean, I think you have to talk to the people who are really uh, putting those kind of deals together. Sure. Could bite dance, divest, you know, and sell TikTok to someone by September, which, you know, by the way, is getting really close to the meat of the election mm -hmm. season. Good point. And I think that's something that you're hearing on the Hill, a little bit of concern, a little trepidation. What would that mean? Could they find a buyer? I think it's, you know, if somebody wants to buy it, I'm sure. But could you put a deal together like that that quickly? Um, yeah. That's or an open question. Would that deal stand up to antitrust scrutiny when this huh. administration in particular is very focused on competition is another question. I the think the other end of the story. Indeed. Another remarkable thing about this vote, though, was that it was bipartisan. This is something that got done in the House, and that's a pretty hard feat. 
these days, especially uh, with a very narrow and getting more narrow Republican majority, because next Friday will be Ken Buck, the Republican congressman from Colorado. Uh, his last day in the House will shrink that margin further. And Lauren Boebert, also current congresswoman from a different district, is running for his seat to replace him in November, but not going to run in the special election to replace him now. And I wonder, Kate, if that is a calculation because the majority is so thin. If Speaker Mike Johnson was like, look, we cannot have you leave that third district yeah, seat if at this she moment. Had, if she had resigned to run, then it would have been another vacancy. I don't know that she's necessarily taking her cues from the speaker or where, you know, how she's making this decision, but it can maybe give, you know, House Republican leaders a little a little breath of relief um, that they're not losing one more um, in, you know, in the next couple of weeks. But uh, who knows? I mean, it's so such a narrow majority that anything can happen. And you even have people out and they can't vote. It throws a lot of things into chaos. All right. Kate Ackley of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much. Meanwhile, elsewhere, President Biden and former President Donald Trump securing their respective parties' nominations, setting up their rematch in November. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Mario Parker. So, Mario, we all knew this is where this was going. We just now are finally in the moment. And it kind of speaks to the fact that we're talking about a former president and a current president with very high name recognition. They now have eight months to hypothetically change some minds to convince people to vote for them. But how many minds are even left to change over the course of this very long general election campaign? That'll be the challenge, Kaylee. I mean, the, the thing is that Donald Trump has this familiar song at his rallies, you can't always have what you want. And we've seen from wide-scale polling, including ours, that Americans don't want this election. So what we've seen so far is both of them, both Trump and Biden, have essentially put forth the negatives of the opposite person, their opponent, but they haven't put forth necessarily, Biden did a little bit last week with the State of the Union, put forth that contrast, that positive vision for going forward. So where does the president go from here, considering uh, the gridlock that we're seeing on Capitol Hill and his inability to connect coming off a state of the union? We're looking at a new all time low approval rating, which should be showing a bump. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was getting at with last week's State of the Union. Mm -hmm. It was widely uh, panned as a, a, or billed as a, a fiery address, and it just didn't resonate. And that seems to be some of the frustration that's been coming with, from the White House the economic message, some of the things that the legislation has done for improving Americans' lives and how voters haven't been receptive to that as well, the nostalgia that they've had for uh, former President Donald Trump as well. The White House has had trouble kind of stirring that angst that Americans have felt four years ago toward Trump as well. Um, the question is, I mean, we see President Biden right now kind of fanning out to those key battleground states. Yeah. And that'll be what we'll see over the next few months. It's just those blue wall states. Well, and one of those battlegrounds is Georgia. And another factor in this is our swing state polling here at Bloomberg with Morning Consult, which includes Georgia, factors in the question of whether or not the former president could be convicted of a felony and how that might change the minds of voters. But in the pe is Georgia the peach state? Yes, it is. In the peach state, trying to use a different word for Georgia here, the judge in his election interference case, in which it's him and a multitude of other defendants, actually dropped six counts, three against him today. He's still facing 10. But does that affect him politically at all, to start seeing things legally going his way, or at least something going his way? That does. Uh, to your point, in terms of just what our polling has shown, our polling has shown that even while Donald Trump leads President Biden and most of those key swing states, including Georgia, that there is some trepida trepidation and hesitation on the part of swing vote, swing state voters uh, and independents when it comes to whether or not the former president would be indicted, right? That changes the calculus a whole lot. And so the fact that he's had a few of those legal wins over the last couple of months, this is like the third one, the Supreme Court, et cetera, um, that, that, that bodes well for him going forward. You covered uh, Donald Trump as a president. He's a candidate again. Looks like he's going to court on March 25th. Will he be able to continue to do this campaigning from the courtroom 
exercise for what could be the balance of the spring. It's been working well for him so far. And that's the question, because it worked well in the primary, they, right, yeah. to galvanize some of those Republican voters. But now you do need, whether or not uh, his, his, he's back, baked in, the, the view of him is baked in, you do need a few converts, right? You do mm. need to bring some independents back into that fold. And it's what the question is whether or not they'll have some type of distaste uh, around some of those court cases. Now, you mentioned that I have covered him before, and a lot of these court cases have seemed like those COVID hearings from before, oh. right, where <laughs> ostensibly they were about one thing, but yeah. really they were campaigning. He's been doing that so far. Every indication from his campaign is that he'll continue to do that. Mario Parker, great to have you back with us at the table on Balance of Power. We thank you. Coming up, European leaders preparing for an emergency meeting over support for Ukraine. We'll have more on that next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and radio. If Russia wins the war in Ukraine, if Putin wins the war in Ukraine, he will attack one more time. He will attack other states because this is a Russian imperialism reborn and it is greedy. It will be willing to attack further. That is why it has to be stopped. It has to be blocked and it has to be punished. And this is the most important task that is facing the community of the West today. And this community is led by the United States of America. The president of Poland, Andrzej Duda, speaking with us yesterday right around this time on Balance of Power, talking through an interpreter. This is German Chancellor Olaf Scholz calls for an emergency summit with Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk and French President Emmanuel Macron to discuss support for Ukraine. Joining us now to talk about the latest here, Jennifer Welch, Bloomberg Economics Chief Geoeconomics Analyst, who's not only looking at this scenario, but what an increase in defense spending in Europe might mean for U.S.-based defense contractors. It's a great reporting, Jenny. It's great to have you back here on the program. To, just to start with what we heard from the president in this room yesterday, if Russia wins the war in Ukraine, as we just heard, he will attack one more time. He will attack other states. Is that the feeling across Eastern Europe? I think it certainly represents the perspective, especially for those frontline states, the Baltic states, Poland, et cetera, that are looking right across at Russia, that know the history of Russia's past expansionist claims and very much are concerned that a victory in Ukraine could embolden Moscow to seek out additional gains elsewhere. Well, and that's essentially what we were hearing from President Duda yesterday, the idea that this matters to Ukraine's neighbors as well. He came to Washington with this request for the defense spending of NATO countries to increase as a proportion of GDP. Currently, the level is 2 percent, which not all members of the alliance meet. He would like it to be raised to 3 percent. Is that possible? It is technically possible. It is very challenging, especially for certain NATO members that are facing really high debt levels, that have very high other social spending commitments that would force a trade-off in their budgets, especially with aging demographics. It just becomes a harder and harder sell the more you try and go past even up to 2 percent. We right now think 18 members are likely to meet that goal this year. If you raise it to 3 percent, only a handful would probably be able to achieve that based on current spending plans. Your Global Insight column today at uh, Bloomberg Economics talks about a rising European defense budget. Whether or not this goes to 3 percent, even if it stayed the way it is now, we're going to see more dollars. How many of them go to U.S. contractors? So European demand for U.S. weapons has definitely increased in recent years, and especially in the wake of Ukraine. And Europe is still trying to rebuild its defense industry and push more contracts out there. But in the meantime, they're still likely to procure a lot from U.S. defense companies, which are the major global arms sellers. The challenge is that, one, will U.S. defense companies have the capacity to meet that challenge? And two, Europe is seeking to build up its own defense industry. We saw earlier this month discussion about trying to buy at least 50 percent of arms from EU-based companies by 2030. They're also investing in funds to rebuild that defense industry over time. So I think right now there's a huge opportunity for defense, U.S. defense companies, but they might start to see more competition from their European counterparts soon. All right, Jennifer Welch of Bloomberg Economics, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Now, coming up, President Biden campaigning in the swing state of Wisconsin today, a day after achieving the number of delegates needed to be the Democratic nominee. We'll have a look into the race with Alan Abramowitz of Emory University after the break.
That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lyons in Washington. With both President Biden and former President Trump securing the delegates needed to take their party's nomination, the attention, of course, now turns to the general election, even though we've been saying that since New Hampshire, an eight-month-long slog, a long runway. And we're joined now by Alan Abramowitz, Emory University professor of political science. Good to see you, Professor. Welcome back. You're famous for your Time for Change model, which has been remarkably accurate, and it has three factors, one of which is a first-term incumbency advantage. And here we are with the first not only rematch in almost 70 years, but effectively two incumbents running against each other. How do you exactly yeah. weigh the average for that? Well, I, I think it raised some questions about the relevance of the model when you have two incumbents. Uh, I have never uh, tried to forecast the outcome of an election where you had one, uh, the current incumbent running against a former incumbent. Uh, normally, you would think the first term advantage would still hold because Biden would be at the end of his first term, um, whereas Trump has already served one term but earlier. But it's very hard to know what, what to make of that. And I'm not at all sure that the model is relevant anymore anyway because of the intense political polarization that we're dealing with right now in our country. I think it makes it, makes it questionable that voters are going to respond the same way to these candidates themselves, to the issues and to the economic conditions the way they did in an earlier era where the level of partisan polarization was not as intense. Well, and Professor, something Joe and I were speaking about earlier with this idea of essentially this being two incumbents is the name recognition. It must be off the charts. It must be as close to perfect as you could possibly get for, for two mm -hmm. individuals. Voters know who these men are. Right. They likely already know how they feel about them. Right. So what changes the mind over the course of an eight-month period of, of a voter? I would point to USA, Suffolk, uh, USA Today Suffolk University polling that came out. Those they polled, a quarter of them said they might change their minds before November. But I just wonder if you think that's believable and how that mind change would realistically happen. Uh, I think that's an exaggeration. Um, people may <laughs> want to uh, believe that they're open uh, to persuasion uh, based on you know what happens during the campaign, based on new evidence. But in reality, the vast majority of voters are uh, you know, tied to one candidate or the other through their partisan affiliation. That's what we've seen in every recent election. Um, and I would think that would be the same this time. Uh, realistically, there's probably no more than 5 to 10 percent uh, of the electorate who are movable in one direction or the other. So that, that's what's going to ultimately decide the outcome. And not only that, we're talking about 5 percent, 5 to 10 percent of the electorate in a handful of states, because it really doesn't matter whether we have movement uh, in the vast majority of states that are relatively safe or totally safe for one party or the other. It's going to come down to six, seven, maybe eight states at most, where that very small sliver of persuadable voters will decide the outcome. Interesting night in Georgia. It helped to put Joe Biden over the top. It also brought some potential trouble for Donald Trump. And I wonder how you're reading into it, Alan, with 77,000 votes for Nikki Haley. And I realize mm -hmm. that there was some early voting here when she was still in right. the race. But Donald Trump lost Georgia by fewer than 12,000 votes. Does that tell us something about the general? It might. Uh, we've seen this in, in some of the other recent primaries where, um, of course, Haley just dropped out. But um, she's getting a uh, substantial share of the vote. Uh, and we know from polling that many of these Haley voters are essentially uh, never Trump voters. Uh, many of them are either soft Republicans or independents and a few Democrats who are uh, very reluctant to support Donald Trump or looking for an alternative to Trump. The question is now, given the choice between Trump and Biden, which one do they find less objectionable? They probably find both of them. Many of them probably find both of these candidates objectionable for different reasons. Um, but the question is, which one is less objectionable? Is that actually the question? Which one 
do I deign to vote for? Or is the mm -hmm. actual question, do I vote at all? There could be a question of do I vote at all. Um, I think turnout is certainly uh, you know, up for grabs. Um, both campaigns will be working very hard to turn out their respective party bases uh, to make sure their supporters do get to the polls. Um, but given the ambivalence that um, a substantial number, though a minority of voters, uh, feel about the, uh, the two candidates, um, turnout could be a question. Now, we've seen very high turnout in recent elections. 2018 set a record for turnout in a midterm election for the modern era. 2020 set a record for turnout in a presidential election for the modern era. I suspect in the end, turnout will be high, mainly because the stakes in this election are so great, because the contrast between these two candidates, both in terms of personality and, more importantly, I think, in terms of policies, what they, uh, policies they support and what they would do in the, in the Oval Office, I think is so great that I think in the end, that's going to drive uh, voters to the polls in large numbers. What does Alan Abramowitz do with RFK Jr.? I'm just curious. We're making headlines here today, apparently, about a running mate. We're going to hear about it tomorrow, whether it's yeah. Jesse Ventura or Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. Is this a TMZ story or, or, or something with real political impact? I think it's more of a TMZ story. Um, what we've seen, uh, again, in recent elections is that support for independent and third-party candidates tends to diminish as we get closer to the election, especially when the stakes are so high and the differences between the two major party candidates are so great. And voters start to think about the fact that a vote for a third party or an independent, and this would be true of RFK Jr., this would be true of some unnamed no-labels candidate, um, is a wasted vote. Uh, that candidate has zero chance of becoming the next president. So are you going to cast a ballot for someone who has absolutely no chance of becoming president, uh, I think in the end that only a small number of voters, they'll get some votes if, the, if they're on the ballot. That's also a question. Uh, but uh, I don't think it'll be anything approaching the numbers that we've been seeing in some recent polls. Alan, just quickly, we have less than a minute left. We did get mm -hmm. some news in the Trump election interference case in Georgia today. Some counts right. dropped. We're awaiting news on whether Fonnie Willis will still be the prosecutor. Will the outcome of that case, if it, if it doesn't actually go to trial before the election, have influence on Georgia voters? I think with all of these cases that it really depends on the timing. So if we get sure. verdicts um, before the election, there's a potential that it could have at least a small impact. I don't think the impact actually will be all that great because, again, voters have already sort of factored this into their equations and they already have such strong opinions about the candidates. And look, Trump supporters largely believe that, that you know, these legal cases are just rigged, right, you know, that, that this is phony targeted. stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, Alan Abramo, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up, we'll talk TikTok in China with Mary Lovely of the Peterson Institute. This is Bloomberg. The magic potion that makes TikTok TikTok is its unique algorithm. And uh, you can't force the Chinese to divest the algorithm if it owns the company. And so no matter what happens here, uh, I don't know who is going to want to put up billions of dollars if the Chinese refuse to provide you the secret gateway to, uh, to that, that, of what makes TikTok TikTok. That was Mark Ginsburg, the former U.S. ambassador to Morocco and founder and president of the Coalition for a Safer Web. He joined us earlier on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And joining us now on Balance of Power, Mary Lovely, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, who focuses heavily on China and its relationship with the U.S. Mary, thank you so much for joining us on the day that the TikTok bill passed the House with a massive bipartisan majority. Members of that body will tell you this is not a bill to ban TikTok. It is a bill to divest TikTok from its Chinese owner ByteDance. The fact of the matter is, though, China would have to be on board with that. Considering they called the House move bullying behavior, do you think there's any world in which China would sign off on this? No, I don't. I don't think there's any world in which China will sign off on this for exactly the reasons that we just heard. Um, the algorithm is a secret sauce for TikTok. 
Um, and it's also, from the Chinese point of view, a slippery slope. Uh, if the U.S. can force divestiture of TikTok, what else can it do to Chinese business interests in the United States? What's a bigger threat to this actually happening? The concerns about constitutional rights, freedom of speech, or the amount of time that's been allotted this arbitrary six months to sell a company? Because this is going into a protracted legal fight one way or the other. Yeah, I actually don't know. I think we're in new territory. I think what concerns many uh, observers is the fact that this is calling out a specific company and a specific set of countries. And, and so it's very different than what the U.S. usually does. Um, I think that we are entering in to unprecedented territory. And I was actually surprised it wasn't more pushback in the House, um, although I think we will see pushback on constitutional grounds when it goes to the floor of the Senate. Well, we've already heard some senators voicing those concerns about constitutionality, also voicing concerns about precedent, the idea that potentially another country could look at what the U.S. would do in this hypothetical scenario and try to force that on a U.S. company. I know you say that China would be worried about what this would mean for other Chinese companies, companies doing business in the U.S., but what could this potentially mean for U.S. companies that do business in China? Couldn't this go both ways? Oh, absolutely. This is putting American companies right in the crosshairs. And um, there are already rules in China that separate American companies from, for example, Chinese data that's in the cloud. Um, so they already have data protections that we don't have in the United States. Uh, but the Chinese, of course, could retaliate in a number of ways to make business more difficult and less profitable for American companies, and even in some cases, force American companies to sell their interests uh, in their Chinese affiliates. So I think a lot of different retaliatory moves would be on the table here, and many would view the Chinese as justified in retaliation here. So I think that um, the whole world's watching this and seeing where do we go from here? And it's unlikely that we're going to go anyplace good for international business. Mary, we spoke with uh, earlier today on Bloomberg FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. He was on Bloomberg surveillance, talked about the future of TikTok. Listen to what he said. This plainly is a conduct law, meaning we're acting because of the demonstrated malign national security threat of TikTok, not because of the content of anybody's speech. And the bill is narrowly tailored, which is key for First Amendment analysis, because it simply requires divestment, meaning the millions of Americans that love TikTok, I'm not one of them, but they can continue to use the application, but just in a more secure way. Wouldn't they also still be able to use the application in the old fashioned way if this is somehow passed and TikTok is banned Everybody under 40 is going to get on a VPN and still find TikTok, right? Yes, we would act more like our friends in China, many of whom are using VPN. <laughs> um, I really don't see the arguments here. We have seen repeatedly arguments that somehow content on TikTok is different. There's more pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli type of content. There's other forms of content that are viewed to be skewed in the direction of policies espoused by the Chinese government. None of that seems very convincing to me. Of course, there's always possibility of, uh, you know, confidential information that's been given to individual Congress people that we are not privy to. But just on the basis of the information that we have been given, I just don't see the danger that is being outlined here. I do see a danger from um, maligning content. Uh, we just saw today threats to uh, young people from uh, apps like Discord. However, what we need is broader legislation that protects Americans' uh, privacy rights, data protections, and also provides guidance to these companies as to how they are to moderate content. So this bill is going to allow legislatures to look like they're doing something to protect American data and American privacy. But in fact, I think they're falling short in both of those areas. The risk is, of course, not so much about this individual company, but about what it says about the larger regulatory environment in the United States and what it will sure. mean for U.S. affiliates abroad. 
Well, and of course, this is not the only action we have seen the U.S. take or consider taking in the name of national security as it relates to China. There are also export restrictions to consider, for example, tariffs that are still uh, in place for many goods that have existed since the Trump administration. This comes against a backdrop of a lot of tension, if you will, economically and technology-wise between these two countries. Mary, do you see that improving anytime soon, especially when the Congress is considering legislation like this? No, and definitely not before the election. We don't see it improving. Um, you know, we also see some, I think, very scary and destabilizing proposals from former President Trump uh, on the campaign campaign. Uh, that on the campaign uh, route that uh, would suggest even greater uh, action by the U.S. to decouple from China. There has been no move to reduce tensions in areas that are not in critical uh, sectors. Uh, why do we still have tariffs on, on tablecloths and other types of non-critical goods? There's been really very little attempt to, to de-escalate here. And that concerns me because um, we know that there's a potential for much more costly types of conflict, not only that would affect U.S. businesses, but obviously affect U.S. military operations and other issues uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. So I think that there's a lot of concern about the election year rhetoric. Um, we're hoping a lot of that is simply rhetoric and that we can begin to say this are these are real issues of national security concern. And I have to admit, there are many who think TikTok is in that basket, even though I do not. And these are other areas in which we don't see a national security concern. I think it's time that we had that kind of balance because China just simply isn't going away. It's a major player in the global economy. Mary, thanks for weighing in today. Mary Lovely, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute. It's good to have you back on Bloomberg. Coming up, we'll play it to our panel as the TikTok bill faces a less certain future in the Senate. And we haven't really heard from Donald Trump yet, one way or the other. This is Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio. That's the responsibility of Congress. That's our responsibility to guard against these kind of national security issues. That's why we acted on this. We're not talking about banning TikTok. This is up to TikTok. This is up to ByteDance. They make the decision on whether they want it to go away or whether they want to divest themselves of the ownership of this. Just don't call it a ban. Republican Congressman from Georgia, Buddy Carter on Bloomberg earlier, uh, joining Democratic and Republican voices making that point as we assemble our political panel. Megan Hayes is back, the chief of staff of the American International Group, former special assistant to the president. Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies, back with us as well. Maura, what is conservative about forcing a company to divest in an arbitrary period of time, in this case six months, or be banned. Is that Republican? Republicans used to stand for pro-business. Uh, you know, I think so to that to that end, I don't really know that they're messaging to the best of their abilities there. But TikTok with their relationship to China is a concern. And Republicans have been harping on that aspect of, of, of the control that ByteDance has and the ties to uh, the Communist Party of China. So I, I it's interesting now because obviously the biggest role that has changed here is Trump's involvement. Trump uh, has recently met with some folks who are invested heavily in TikTok and is dissuading Congress from taking action. And so you're hearing that messaging change where they're saying they're not trying to ban TikTok anymore and that they're really just uh, looking for them to distance themselves from China's uh, CCP, so the Communist Party there. Uh, so it's, it's really, again, it, it's all about Trump, and, and that's not what the original onset of this was. Uh, so it's disappointing. Yeah, Jeff Yass, of course, who I think you're referring to, a big TikTok investor, Republican donor, who we know the former president has met with recently. Even so, even with Trump talking about how he doesn't think TikTok should be banned uh, now, despite what he may have thought during his administration, only 16 Republicans didn't vote for this bill in the House, Megan. 
huge bipartisan majority. Only 65 votes against the whole thing It's an entire in its entirety. You don't really see numbers like that in this Washington right now, Megan. And yet, that's not a mandate for the Senate. Do you think the Senate will pass this? You know, I think the Senate has a tough go at this. I think that there's a lot of other impacts that we're not talking about. There's a large economic impact right up against an election. There's an outreach issue here that gets very political. I do think that there's obviously a national security component here. And I think that one thing that Democrats and Republicans can probably also agree on is the messaging here has been botched. Maybe then uh, the president is calling the bluff of Congress. Sure, I'll <laughs> sign it because I know it'll never get to the White House. TikTok very effectively squashed all of this with an extensive lobbying spend last year. They're working now on the Senate. Is that going to be a more powerful force than Donald Trump? Because it's proven to work so far. I mean, everyone has seen how far Donald Trump's tentacles can go, so I would yeah. not underestimate his power in some of the business community. I do think that the Senate is going to have an uphill battle. I mean, this is a national security issue. They're not wrong in that. But I think that using the term ban has been, is not in their favor, and it's not working for them. All right, so we'll see what Chuck Schumer decides to do with this. He hasn't really indicated either like way beyond saying today? that, yeah, the <laughs> that statement was, was incredibly short. Looking forward <laughs> no, to that look bill at the legislation, here. no real hint, no real endorsement, certainly. Um, but of course, the Senate is a very different beast than the House is. But I want to talk a little bit more about the House, Maura, because of course, we all got the news yesterday that Ken Buck, the Republican congressman from Colorado who had already said he was going to retire, isn't even going to stick it out until November. He is leaving next Friday, March 22nd. That margin is going to get even tighter for House Speaker Mike Johnson. How are we going to get anything done? That's going to be really tough. And I think you're seeing the fraying of the Republican Party again uh, because uh, you know, the Republicans are currently on their you know, GOP retreat. A lot of members didn't show up. Uh, there's just This is just a reason to show you that MAGA movement is not sustainable because it's not been about legislating. One, their messaging has been terrible. They're, we just talked about TikTok. The impeachment is going completely south. And now you have an even smaller majority than you had to begin with, which was already razor thin. This is a real problem for Republicans. The RNC just got slashed by 60 plus staffers. They can't fundraise very well. They're they're being you know completely trounced by the DNC when it comes to fundraising. The Republicans are having a real issue here. And Ken Buck leaving it in this way to, you know, and some people are saying it's to kind of keep Lauren Boebert out from having a chance at having a seat here in Colorado. I kind of like it, uh, but I think it's interesting <laughs> to the devolving state of the GOP in the House. I was surprised by Ken's announcement. I'm looking forward to talking with him about that. That quote is from the Speaker of the House. You work for uh, a former Speaker Maura, can you just talk to us about what an unusual move this is? No one saw it coming. I'm leaving next week. Again, this just shows you the the lack of unity in the House GOP. Uh, there's no real trust or even some in some respects, some respect between the leadership and rank and file, because for a lot of the members that are in Congress, especially on the House side, they no longer believe in rank and file versus leadership. Uh, they don't see Mike Johnson as the leader of their party or as the leader of their coalition and of their conference. And that says and speaks volumes truly um, about what's going on right now in Congress. Just quickly, Megan, you believe Buck was trying to stick it to Bobert? Is that the work in theory here? I mean, sure. I'm not, I'm not quite certain what, what this does. I just know it's going to be really challenging to get any work done with such a thin margin. All right. Well, we're going to try to keep getting work done here because we have more to talk about <laughs> coming up. The race between President Biden and Donald Trump is just beginning, as if it hadn't already started. Megan and Mora will be back with us after the break. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Here in Milwaukee will mean $36 million in new federal funding to rebuild 6th Street. It will mean wider sidewalks for children walking to school, safer bike lanes for residents and visitors, dedicated bus lanes to get work to get to work faster, new new trees to provide shade, and modern infrastructure to prevent sewage from flowing into the Milwaukee River and the Lake Michigan. These are life-changing improvements. That was President Biden in Wisconsin earlier this afternoon. Part of his swing state swing 
after the State of the Union. Our political panel is back with us, Megan Hayes and Maura Gillespie. So, Megan, we are now almost a full week out from the State of the Union, and in typical fashion, he's going to the states that will have a huge hand in deciding the way this election is going to go. Now that it is Trump versus Biden, they have the numbers to be the nominees. And yet the figures show that over the last week, since the State of the Union, he has not gotten the bump that you might expect in polling. If he hasn't gotten it now, when's he going to get it? Can he get it? I think the people haven't tuned in. I think people are going to tune in closer to the election after the conventions in the, in the fall. I do think, you know, this ultimately comes down to a race between Donald Trump and Joe Biden and their visions for the future. I think most people know what their visions are and can expect to know what they're going to say. So they're not really paying attention right now. And then they'll start to pay attention when it gets closer to voting time. Um, I'm not too concerned about his chances right now and his poll numbers going up or at least being victorious in the polls in November. Is this the last gasp of uh, Nikki Haley, Mora? What happened in Georgia last night? 77,000 votes go to the former candidate, uh, who, of course, was still in the race when a lot of people were early voting. Will we now in the primaries see her drop off, or could this be a persistent protest vote? I'd like to see it be a consistent protest vote, to be quite, to be quite honest. But it does show us that Donald Trump has a real problem in reaching across to the Republicans who are tired of his antics and are sick of giving money to uh, a campaign that is only set out to really stop him from going to prison. And so I think that that's you know, telling that there are still so many voters that are either protest voting or not showing up. I mean, Hawaii had less than 5,000 people vote in the primary. That's pretty pretty shocking, a pretty low number. So, you know, again, we have eight months or just shy of eight months till election day. So a lot of time Mm -hmm. for this general election campaigning to go underway and to get people motivated. But I don't know what will motivate them aside from not wanting the other person to win. Well, yeah, the motivation question is an interesting one to consider. And this is a conversation we've been having today when you already really know these candidates. One served as president, one is the president now. You probably know how you feel about each of them. So it raises the question of to what degree minds can change over the course of eight months. New polling from USA Today and Suffolk released today shows Trump is ahead of Biden, 40 to 38 in the general. But one in four said they could change their minds before November. Alan Abramowitz of Emory told us it's probably more 5 to 10 percent than 25 percent that could change their minds. But what do you think? I, I agree with that. I don't think that that many people are going to change their minds. I think that most the the issue that the campaigns have now is voter turnout. You need to get people to turn out because neither candidate seemed to be able to change undecided voters. So you need to get people to show up. And you also that's going to impact down ballot races. So it's really incumbent on the Biden campaign to continue to build a broad coalition to go after those Haley voters and to really bring them over to to be to win in November. But I do think that it's about voter turnout now. It's not people aren't going to change their minds. How does Joe Biden clear the bar to the extent that he did at the State of the Union and see no bump? Even a sort of average State of the Union, you see a little bump with the road show. People are talking about you. You get on the front page and lead the newscast. To sink to a new all-time low, according to 538, tells us what? I think that people have this expectation that they, they watched the State of the Union and wanted to see the president make an error or to forget something or look like this like, Is that it? dithering old man that this he's just not. This was the NASCAR not. crowd hoping to see yeah, a crash. I, yeah, exactly. And I just don't think that's realistic. That's not who Joe Biden is. That's not who he is as a president. So I think that people, they're not like, they're like, oh, you're out there being the president. You're out there giving your speech and, and telling what you've done for the country and your vision to move forward. You weren't, you, we weren't watching the crash that we, the news was trying to make it be. So I think that, you know, like his, the bar here is pretty high for him to change the the, the um, approval rating, but I do think that he has opportunity to move some of these voters from the Haley camp over to him. But it, it is, again, about voter turnout come November. Well, and whether or not you can get voters to show up for the main parties or whether they'd maybe choose a third party more quickly, just on that third party, RFK Jr. says he's going to announce a VP coming up here pretty soon, and maybe it'll be Aaron Rodgers. Really? So... To that end, I think it's largely because you have an exhausted voter base. People are not interested. You've, you've seen the polls, 70 percent. People don't want this rematch that we are now getting. And both parties have more or less, I mean, isolated a lot of the white heterosexual males. So those are the ones that are really leaning towards RFK Jr. What better way to uh, appeal to them further than by having a NFL quarterbacker <laughs> be your uh, <laughs> VP running mate. So I think that they're trying to appeal to them. The rest of the electorate is pretty exhausted by the politics and by the, uh, you know, partisanship that's happening on Capitol Hill. So I, I think 
to Megan's point and what we've been talking about, voter turnout is is important here, but RFK Jr. is definitely capitalizing on uh, the celebrity aspect of his campaign. <laughs> Guess they'd have a corner on the anti-vax vote. We can talk <laughs> next time about who that might come out of. Thanks uh, to Megan Hayes and Maura Gillespie for a great conversation. As always, we invite you to check out the Washington Edition newsletter for more on all the stories we've been discussing. Find it on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you tomorrow. This is the weekend.